Okay, today we're finishing chapter 6 of First Timothy, and that finishes the entire book of First Timothy. So, again, uh, the reason we study the scriptures like we do is that we are currently in training for the future reigning, and uh, so we learn sound doctrine that helps us to understand what is expected of us. This letter is Paul's leadership manual for his entrusted servant, Timothy, who is filling in a role for Paul as Paul is out and about, and Timothy is left behind to kind of oversee the work of that church uh, in Ephesus. <clears throat> Here's our quiz from last week. which was from chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. So true or false, false teaching is teaching that contradicts the teaching of Paul. First test of a false teacher is whether they have the gospel right. If they don't, you can bet that there are many other errors in what they teach. Don't listen to them. That is true. Some characteristics of false teachers Paul pointed out to Timothy were that they were conceited and that they understand nothing but they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and verbal disputes. And that was true. False teachers may also see the position of elder pastor teacher as a way to personal fame and fortune. And this is where the love of money becomes the root of all kinds of evil as these teachers begin to teach to please the crowds rather than to equip the saints with sound doctrine. Again, that's true and we pointed out uh, a few of these big name teachers and uh, the massive fortunes that they have accumulated um, over time. True or false, the median salary of pastors in the United States, according to salary.com, is about $102,000. Verse 8 of 1 Timothy 6 says, If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. These two statements are reconcilable. Is that true or false? It depends, I guess, on who you ask. Uh, it's extremely hard work to do the job right. Uh, you have to be able to support a family. Uh, if you have a, a family of four or six people, $100,000 doesn't go very far. It'd be sufficient to have probably a house and a car and get your kids to school and so forth. So is that unreasonable? No. Um, but then again, you go, there's very few churches, uh, these smaller churches that can support <clears throat> that kind of a salary. And so, you know, Paul's point of view back in the day when he wrote this was if you have food and, and shelter, like a house, <clears throat> with these, you should be content. So I, I have a hard time with this. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to reconcile it in my own mind. So I, I don't have a definite answer on this. True or false, the best churches are mega churches. This is where you're going to see your money at work, especially if you're tithing and going beyond the tithe and paying your first fruits and all of these kinds of things that these people try to get you to pay. Um, you'll get the big name pastors. Everybody knows their names. They have the big new multi-purpose buildings, uh, large well-paid staff, cover all the ages and stages of the congregation. You'll have great uh, audio-visual equipment, especially for the rock band music that's played there. And then they'll have lots and lots of kingdom programs that you can participate in to bring in the kingdom before Christ returns. The best churches are, are not mega churches. I can assure you of that. Uh, if there's a huge number of people going there, it's like going to the wide road instead of the narrow road. There's a reason so many people are attending that, and it's likely not because so many people are interested in sitting there listening to somebody teach the Bible word for word, verse for verse, book by book, and hearing exactly what God has to say. 1 Timothy 6, and this is verses 11 through 21 from the Net Bible 2nd edition. So this is final instructions 
and these are more specific to Timothy. The others have been about elders in general. So, but you as a person dedicated to God, keep away from all that. Instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. And you see the Greek text that supports the translation into the English from that, which comes from the Nestle Hall in 28th edition. Paul says Timothy is to be different than these other types of elders and teachers. He calls Timothy a man of God. Um, this is a person who is dedicated to God. He is an anthrope theo. He, he, it means somebody whose life and conduct represent the mind of God and fulfill his will. And this really should be said of all believers. <clears throat> and it can be when we're walking in the Spirit, when the Spirit is guiding our uh, thoughts and speech and actions. So as one dedicated to God, we're to stay away from those that Paul mentions in chapter 6, verses uh, 3 and so forth. If somebody spreads false teachings, doesn't agree with sound words, that is, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the teaching that accords with godliness, he's conceited, understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in controversies, verbal disputes. This gives rise to envy, dissension, slanders, and evil suspicions, and constant bickering. This is not the kind of person you want to be or be around, and constant bickering by people corrupted in their minds and deprived of truth, who suppose that godliness is a way of making a profit. A godliness combined with contentment brings a great profit. For we brought nothing into this world, and so we cannot take a single thing out either. But if we have food and shelter, we shall be satisfied with that. And those who long to be rich, however, stumble into temptation and a trap, and many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evils. Some people, in reaching for it, have strayed from the faith and stabbed themselves with many pains. So Christians today are generally too trusting and too biblically dumb, just to be blunt, are too biblically dumb to identify false teaching. And so the devil uses the church for his own purposes and the pastors as his community organizers. And this is why the church is going apostate in these last days. But he tells Timothy, instead, you as a man of God, pursue righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. And to pursue, it means to follow after without hostility, uh, these things which are good. So pursue righteousness, which is the character or quality of taking right or just actions. Righteousness is an attribute of God. So godliness, attitude characterized by doing what's pleasing to God. Faithfulness is acting reliably, reliably with fidelity, with commitment to Christ. Love is to act with esteem and regard, with affection, goodwill, giving of oneself towards your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Endurance means bearing up courageously under suffering, uh, hanging in there, staying with it. Gentleness is an attitude of mildness and meekness rather than harshness when dealing with other people. So those are good character qualities that he wants Timothy to continue to uh, demonstrate, which would be quite different than these other guys. This would be quite a contrast to the men Paul has described above, would set Timothy apart from them. Timothy would be modeling the mature Christian and Christ modeling of servant leadership, whereas these other false teachers would be modeling the Pharisees of old, and now the Gnostics who have come on the scene, and the Judaizers who were on the rise in the church. The Gnostics and Judaizers didn't take well to being questioned or to receiving any criticism, and when faced with the truth of the scriptures, they got very hot and argumentative. Uh, there were also Jews who hated Paul's teaching, and they were looking for a way to get rid of him. It was some Jews from Ephesus, in fact, that had followed Paul to Jerusalem in Acts 21, accused Paul of bringing Gentiles uh, beyond the Gentile court, which in those days there was a sign posted there. It was a violation punishable by death. 
That's what got Paul arrested the first time and eventually caused him to appeal his case to Caesar. Acts 21 through 28 deals with that whole situation. And that's where we left Paul in the book of Acts. In Acts 28, he was still uh, in Rome uh, under arrest. But we know later that he gets released and he's out and about for a while. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of what eternal life you were called for. Make your good confession for in the, uh, in the presence of, uh, and made your good confession for in the presence of many witnesses. Paul seems to always have his uh, coach, uh, athlete hat on. Here he goes back to the athletic metaphor in encouraging Timothy. The Greek literally says, fight the good fight. He's like that coach in your corner there that's telling you to get up and you know get, get after it. Uh, the, uh, the Greek actually says, agonizo ton kalon agona, uh, which you can see the word agonize in the Greek, meaning struggle or fight or strive. Paul loves these kinds of challenging encouragements uh, to those in ministry, particularly because it's a struggle and a fight. You, you not only have the devil after you trying to corrupt and discourage you, but you also have people who turn against you, constantly challenge you, don't like this or that about you, <clears throat> what you just said. They try to find something they disagree with uh, in what you taught, and they can be a great source of discouragement. So Paul knows this from the 20 years of practical experience in the field where he's been preaching and teaching and starting churches all over the Roman Empire. Beyond the verbal attacks, he's been, in, you know, Paul's been in prison, uh, stricken with illness, probably malaria on his first missionary journey. He's been beaten, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. Uh, Paul knows what it takes to compete well and how to hang in there. He wants Timothy to compete for the faith. The faith is always under attack. Apostasy, never under attack. Timothy was a bit intimidated, and Paul needs him to step up his game since there's already false teaching occurring and the battle is on. Timothy can do this, as Paul reminds him, Timothy is a possessor of eternal life already. He needed to live like it. It would give him strength to stay in the fight. The same is true for us. Timothy's been a solid teacher of the faith, having previously stated his agreement to sound doctrines. It may have been that the early church took a lot more active interest in baptism, which is what he's referring to about this good confession, took a lot more interest in baptism than the church today. And those being baptized may have actually been questioned and so forth. And so people had an opportunity to make their confessions of what sound doctrine uh, in front of the entire church prior to them being baptized. And this might explain the statement, the good confession for in the presence uh, of many witnesses. Verse 13, I charge you before God who gives life to all things and Christ Jesus who made his good confession before Pontius Pilate to obey this command without fault or failure till the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who's appearing the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords will reveal at the right time. So here's a good reference to uh, Pontius Pilate. You know, some people doubt that he was a historical figure. Well, here's Paul uh, some uh, 20 plus years after uh, this event uh, talking about this man. But uh, Paul has, remember, just reminded Timothy of his past confession and his commitment before human witnesses and now to God and Christ as his present and future witnesses, he wants Timothy to remember. So Paul reminds Timothy of the example Christ set when he made his good confession before Pontius Pilate, Matthew 27, 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor. The governor questioned him saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. So confession, is this word homologion. Uh, Jesus agreed uh, that Pilate, that he, uh, with Pilate that he was indeed the king of the Jews. Paul charges or commands Timothy to do the same thing. Confess, live in agreement with who you are. Don't hide it. The opposite of confession is to hide 
uh, who you are and what you believe. So who is Timothy? He is one who is in the hands of God who gives life. He has the full assurance of God, is under God's protection. He is to exhibit moral courage as a result of this. He is the man of God, as Paul called him. He is a man who has been justified by grace. He's a man who's been gifted and called to ministry. He's a mature Christian. He has sound doctrine. He's able to teach. He's trusted by Paul to stand in for him in Ephesus in Paul's absence. He is authorized and equipped to deal with these false teachers without himself being censured or corrected because of what he knows and also how he lives. He's to remain this way, not just for a little while, but until something happens. And Paul says that's until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's appearing the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, will reveal at the right time. So initially, Paul has in mind this period of time known as the church age, when Christians are called to Christ to be Christ's witnesses on earth. But after this, a time called the day of the Lord will take place. And then comes the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church is going to be removed from the earth in the event called the rapture. The world will be puzzled over where they have gone. Then those left behind will experience the day of the Lord's wrath, followed by the day of the Lord's blessing. The day of the Lord's blessing is when he will appear to all people. Appearing is epiphanias, the glorious display. You can see the word epiphany from this Greek word. And this will be when Jesus returns from heaven in all his majesty and power. And he will be then the king over all of the kings on the earth and the Lord over all the lords of the earth. He will be fully and gloriously revealed at that time, although right now he is hidden from the world. He came to the Jews to offer the kingdom in accordance with the scriptures, but was rejected. And so the kingdom has been postponed until a future generation of Jews believe in him. So the condition of the world right now was and is now, as Paul states in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth <coughs> by their unrighteousness, because what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, this, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts and their senseless hearts were darkened. So even during this time, God offers grace. We, the church, are his ambassadors and ministers of reconciliation. That is, we represent the one who will be the king over all things in that kingdom that is future. We live our lives consistent with values and ethics that reflect the values and ethics of the future kingdom. We serve him now as ministers or workers <clears throat> by making him known to people so that they too can enter this future kingdom through faith in him. Right now, this Jesus, the Christ, the God-man, is in heaven functioning as our great high priest, the one mediator between God and man, and the builder and the head of his church. Israel, his covenant people, have been under the fifth level of discipline uh, as, <clears throat> as described in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, because of their covenant disobedience, which led to their rejection of their own Messiah. They will experience the fullness of it during the day of Jacob's trouble, or what is referred to as the Great Tribulation, which is yet future. The rest of the world is accumulating wrath, as Romans 1.18 through 2.16 uh, indicates. As for his church, he has not instructed us to bring in the kingdom, but to be workers who help bring people into that kingdom. He has sent the Holy Spirit into the world, John 16, 
uh, verse 7, but I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I am going away, for if I do not go away, the Advocate, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Now we obey Christ's command in Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came up and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always till the end of the age. Now we, the church, are commanded to give the correct gospel to people. And then, as it's stated uh, in, in that passage from John, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, uh, he is in the world now convicting all people of their need to trust in Christ. Some people will choose to trust Christ when the Holy Spirit convicts them and they hear the true gospel, they will trust Christ and be saved. These are called the elect or the choice ones of God. We, the, uh, the church, then water baptize them to ident identify them to the local church, members of the local church as believers, and we begin to teach them to obey the law of Christ by walking in the Spirit. That's how they learn to, uh, that's how they obey the law. You can't do it in your flesh. We do not bring in the kingdom. The kingdom can only come when Christ comes and sets it up with all of his power and all of his authority. We don't have that power or authority, nor do we have any instructions from him to do that during this age. We do know that the next kingdom on earth is not Christ's kingdom, but that of the Antichrist. So we should have nothing to do with helping build that for him through what the apostate church calls kingdom works and kingdom programs today. You are not serving the Lord with these, you're serving Satan. Assuming you were saved to begin with, you will not be rewarded to the Bema seat for these works. They will be burned up like hay, wood, and stubble. They're worthless. You will have been deceived. If you are not saved, you will simply have been doing the works of your father, the devil, as Jesus told the Pharisees. Maybe some of these good works will have some merit at the great white throne judgment, and will lessen the degree of punishment in the lake of fire for you, but you will still be in the lake of fire forever. He has given to us, his church, that work to do on earth during his current age. Our other work is to be in training for the future reigning with him as co-heirs of his future earthly kingdom and to be his worldwide body functioning under the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit in the building of his church. Our individual instructions are to grow in sanctification, which is what prepares us and trains us for the future reigning. The acronym for this growth in sanctification is PADME. PADME is an acronym for phases, aim, dimensions, means, and enemies. The phases of our individual sanctification are positional, experiential, and ultimate. Believing the true gospel, that is the one that Paul taught, is when a person has been set apart by God positionally. That's instantaneous, it's at the point of believing. That means that person is justified. God the Father judged him righteous based on being in Christ, who is his righteousness. Now, as a person who is positionally set apart as a believer, the believer is to begin a process of being set apart practically, practically or experientially over time as he walks in the Spirit. In this process, the believer is being conformed to the image of Christ, set apart from the world system to learn obedience to Christ. This is the training part. At rapture or the death, the believer will be ultimately sanctified by receiving a glorified uh, body like Christ, and that body will have no sin nature. Now, the aim of our uh, experiential sanctification is loyalty to Christ. This is what Christ said was the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, with all your mind. 
This is loyalty. This means demonstrating a life that's progressively more and more loyal to Christ. It doesn't mean to stop sinning. It does not mean to be a legalist. On the other hand, it does not mean to have little concern about sin uh, in your life or in the life of others uh, or to become more licentious. The dimensions of our experiential sanctification are fellowship and maturity. Fellowship is the moment to moment um, relationship, uh, not relationship, the fellowship we have with Christ based on whether or not we've sinned. When we sin, we are out of fellowship. When we confess our sin, we're restored to fellowship. The more time we're in fellowship with Christ, the more time we have to prove our loyalty to him. The other dimension is maturity. Maturity is our sanctification over time. From when we were first saved until our death or the rapture, it's expected that we will be growing in the faith over time through study, trust, obedience, and prayer. We should be able to look back over the years and see that growth. The means of our sanctification are law and grace. Law means a standard of behavior. Don't, don't read law as the Mosaic law. That's, a, that's an error. Law means a standard of behavior and, the, and grace means the enablement to carry it out. For the Christian, we have the law of Christ, and it's uh, somewhat similar to the Mosaic law, but it's, it's a grace law. And our enablement is the indwelling Holy Spirit, so that when we walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit fulfills the law in us. The enemies of our sanctification are three, world, flesh, and the devil. World is the whole world system. It's the way it functions, the, the thought system in that in that world and so forth, which suppresses the truth about God, according to Romans 1.18. The flesh is, in this, uh, is the sin nature that each of us has, even after our salvation, that continues wanting to rebel against God. The devil has his schemes and methods that he continues to employ since the fall of man, along with the other schemes and methods that we still fall for uh, if we're not dressed in the armor of God because we're fighting this spiritual battle all the time. When we choose these enemies, we're rebelling against God or sinning. As soon as we're aware of our sin, we confess and restore to fellowship and our walk in the Spirit. Uh, I just threw the uh, three tenses of salvation chart in here again. And um, I'm, of course, I always send along the Word document that goes with this, uh, or you can stop this video and review these if you'd like. I'm don't plan to go through these in detail, but there's an awful lot of information there. But uh, just as uh, talking about the um, idea of your justification, your justification is the big blue circle. Once you've trusted in Christ, you're in this circle forever. You cannot get out of that circle. You're in the double grip of grace. The Father has you in His hands and Christ has you in his hands. There's, there's no way that you get out of that. When you sin, uh, you, uh, you break fellowship. The green, the green circle is fellowship. So you're either in fellowship or you're out of fellowship. When you sin, you go out of fellowship. When you confess, you come back into fellowship. But you never ever get out of the blue circle, which is your justification. You cannot lose your salvation, in other words. He alone possesses immortality and lives in approach, unapproachable light, whom no human has ever seen or is able to see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Paul often injects a doxology in the middle of his writing. He does that here. He's talking about Christ, the coming King, who will be revealed at exactly the right time to the world according to the timing of the Father. Christ is God, as such he possesses the divine attributes of immortality. Uh, this is a word, athanasion. It means deathlessness, freedom from death. Thanos, thanatos is death, and ah negates it, so it's not death. Uh, deathlessness, freedom from that. And Paul says he lives in uh, aprositon, unapproachable, phos, light, is the word. Greek, Greek word is phos for light which is a luminous force from certain bodies which enables the human eye to discern form and color. Paul says no human, anthropon, we get the word uh, uh, anthrop uh, 
anthrop anthropos or uh, anthropology study of man from this word in their human form has ever seen or is able to see. This then brings Paul to glorifying God with to him be the honor in an eternal power. Amen. So that's your doxology and rightly so. And now back to some final practical instructions for Timothy. Command those who are rich in this world's goods not to be haughty or to set their hopes on riches, which are uncertain, but on God who richly provides us with all things for our enjoyment. Ephesus was a place where there were wealthy people among the believers, and wealth can always be deceptive to people who have it because it, sometimes they think that they are secure in this world and that God must have just favored them because they're rich. Uh, Paul doesn't condemn wealth or the wealthy. He does give some instructions for those that have it. He says, uh, don't be um, haughty or high-minded about your material wealth. Don't set your hope, uh, put the grounds for your future uh, on material wealth. Why? Paul says wealth is uncertain. It means individual possession of material goods which are assigned high value can't be guaranteed. So uncertainty in your own wealth should be especially thought about today. Uh, if you live in the United States, you, you use currency uh, that is in the form of bills or coins backed by the good faith of the United States government. It used to be backed by gold, now backed by the good faith. The paper or metal in these objects is of hardly any value. Uh, so should the government stop backing them or should these become less valuable due to inflation or distrust in the government? Um, your wealth can disappear in an instant. Most people have these currencies stored as electronic digital records as part of a bank account or a savings or an IRA or whatever for easy access and in making transactions by checks or debits, debit cards, credit cards. A few keystrokes of a computer can lock you out of it, can change the value of it, or entirely eliminate those assets. Physical property that's yours may be damaged or destroyed by storms, fires, other natural disasters. Having gold and silver is useful only if you can be, uh, exchange it for what goods you need to survive, like food, water, or shelter. There's nothing on this earth that we call wealth that is certain. And the only certainty is that it won't go with you into the next life, as Paul had stated earlier. Paul says this about things we can be certain of, but on God, that's where your trust should be, certainty, who richly provides us with all things for our enjoyment. So when you think about whatever wealth you have uh, as having been provided by God, you're not so likely to put your hope in it but in the one who provides it both now and through eternity. Certainly you can enjoy wealth if God has blessed you with a great opportunities to make a good living, own a home, have plenty to eat, money to spare. If that's true of you, God has certainly blessed you in this life. But he says this, tell them to do good, be rich in good deeds, be generous givers, sharing with others. In this way, they will save up a treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the future and so lay hold of what is truly life. So have you considered that this may be a test of God if you've got plenty, you're wealthy. God is uh, giving you and how you do in this test will affect your position in the kingdom. Taking principles from the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, God rewards those who put those assets he provides to them uh, with to work in a way that pleases him. Enjoy what you have, share what you have, make sure God gets the glory. A kind heart and a generous hand work well together to glorify God with what he has provided you. Since we're not building the kingdom now, but are assigned the mission of making disciples, baptizing them and teaching them, you have the opportunity to utilize some of your God-given wealth to support that mission. Beyond your personal efforts in evangelism, God has gifted certain men as evangelists. They have a calling to go and preach the gospel to people who have never heard in places you'll never go. And you can support these missionaries with some of your God-given wealth. Secondly, God has given pastors and teachers to the church to oversee and teach local churches so that new disciples can be baptized and taught. So you can use your wealth to support the local church, Bible teacher, pastor, teachers. 
You can also misuse your wealth by supporting evangelists who teach a false gospel and churches or pastor teachers who teach false doctrine. We have also already talked about taking care of widows in your family and other parts of scripture to honor your father and mother would include financial help in that area. And that's all part of using God's resources wisely and whether we were rich or poor in this world, Christ will judge our works with what he has provided us uh, at the Bema Seat Judgment. Verse 20 and 21, uh, O Timothy, protect what has been entrusted to you. Avoid the profane chatter and absurdities of so-called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed from the faith. Grace be with you all. Final warning to Timothy, not to get led astray by false doctrine, Gnosticism, philosophy. Don't get sucked into these things and so not finish well in your ministry. But you see this happening to pastors all the time. Uh, the devil has plenty of time. There's always a new group of people who come to church so full of so-called knowledge, fresh out of the pagan public school system and godless workplaces. They're fully indoctrinated with critical race theory, gender theory, climate theory, evolutionary theory, Marxism, social justice concerns, women's health protections, migrant safety, welcoming open borders, pandemic preventions, gay pride, reasonable gun laws, their list gets bigger and bigger every year. They want their pastor to focus the teachings of the church around these issues and to preach positive and affirming messages on these issues. They want to hear that Jesus would have supported all these perversions of sex and science. So find a partial verse or a word here and there and make it fit what we believe. Don't give us word for word, literal, historical, grammatical, contextual teaching from Jesus or Paul or Pe Peter or any of these people that we don't agree with. Give us pastors who are young and cool and woke. And we have and we are and this is apostasy. And that's why the church is in the condition that it's in today. But Timothy, hang in there, Timothy. It was tough in your day, but stay with it. And by the way, Timothy, you would not believe the state of the church in 2022. A few applications. Paul calls for Timothy to fight the good fight for the faith. Calls him a man of God, says that he's to be set apart by being a man that pursues righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. This could be the marching orders for all of us as Christians today in our own churches. We need people to fight for sound doctrine and to model the mature Christian walk. This is something you can do in your own church. Paul says we should be fighting the good fight until the church age ends. Then the glorious appearing of Christ will be seen by the world at his second coming. Having the right eschatology as a Christian is critical to understanding our role during this time. We're not bringing in the kingdom. Only Christ can do that. We're ambassadors of that future kingdom. We work as ministers of reconciliation, making known to people how they can become part of that kingdom by faith in Christ. Paul gives a brief instruction to those who are wealthy. He says, wealth is an uncertain thing. Can't count on it always. You can enjoy it, you can use it for good. And several good ways to use it involve supporting evangelistic ministries, uh, missionaries, and sound Bible teachers as part of the Great Commission. The last lesson here is for sound Bible teachers to hang in there. We're in those last days of the apostate church. There are not many Bible teachers left today, and they're usually found in small churches, not particularly well paid, not particularly well known. They're under constant attack from every direction to stop teaching sound doctrine and get with woke Christianity. Christianity, they need prayer for sure and often need financial support from outside their own churches. Maranatha, uh, next week we will likely get started with the uh, next book Paul wrote, which would be the book of Titus.